My name is Nepachi Fulger. Welcome to the fourth in our series of artist talks for the Kanuyo Asibak Memorial Award shortlisted artists. I'm the Tautung Wakti at Inuit Art Foundation and originally from Iqaluit Nunavut and currently living in North Vancouver, British Columbia. Although we're all joining remotely from across North America today, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the Inuit Art Foundation is currently located. It's on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, this place is home to many, including a diverse urban indigenous community of Inuit, First Nations and Métis. On May 19th, 2023, the Inuit Art Foundation announced the shortlisted artists for Kama in conjunction with the opening of Ananata Unikangit, Our Mother's Stories, their group exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, which runs until November. This is the first year Kama includes a special exhibition for the shortlist thanks to the exceptional support of RBC Emerging Artists. In addition to the exhibition, each artist short, shortlisted for the award received a $5,000 cash prize. This evening, we have the pleasure of hearing Takale Partridge in conversation with Maureen Grubin. Um, Takale Partridge is an Inuk artist, curator, and poet, originally from Kujuak, Nunavik, She's currently the Associate Curator of Indigenous Art with Inuit Art Fo Focus at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Before joining the AGO in 2022, she served as Director of the Nordic Lab at Saw Gallery and Adjunct Curator at the Art Gallery of Guelph. She has also worked as Communications Director for Avatak Cultural Institute and Editor-at-Large for Inuit Art Quarterly. Maureen Grubin is an installation, performance, and textile art artist from Tuktoyaktuk, Inuvialuit settlement region in Northwest Territories, working primarily with fur, hides, skin, and manufactured materials. Grubin forges a link between the land and the communities that live on it in her work, often activating themes around environmentalism, melting ice, and indigenous hunting rights. So welcome, Maureen and Takalik. I'll uh, pass it over to you, Takalik. Thank you, Napachi. So welcome, everyone, to my conversation with Maureen Gruben. As uh, Napachi mentioned, I'm Takalik Partridge. Um, I'm originally from Gutruk, Nunavik, uh, and I now live in Ottawa and work in Toronto at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I'm so happy to be here today with you, Maureen. It's so oh, wonderful so to see fun you. For you. It's been a while. Yeah. And to be a 94, um, it's so nice to be able to speak with you and visit with you in this way. And uh, Queen 92, Napache as well. So I wanted to first. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First of all, I wanted to. Um, say that I was so lucky the first time I met you in person was actually when I brought you to Ottawa for um, an exhibition and it mm -hmm. was like sort of in a like in between space of uh, not so much lockdown and no. um, that was you and Sonia Kelleher Coombs and Cecil Burke and the three of you were just magic together, and it was just such a wonderful way to meet you. It was a beautiful show. A really, really very well curated. I don't know how <laughs> you thought of bringing all of us from so distant um, places, but very um, circumpolar. And uh, yeah, it was beautiful. Well, Sonia had a lot to do with that too, but of course, uh, you know, I'm always thinking about your work, but... Sonia was like, really, really loved your work and really loved Cecil's work too. So then we all were, we were talking about that. But I wonder if you could, since I since we brought that up, I wonder if you could talk about the work that was in that one, which was uh, 
big hello. And then we'll move on to other stuff like your background and stuff. But I just want to talk about that one work right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, big hello is actually here and I'm saving it for my granddaughter because yeah. I think it's just so uh, community based and so personal, right? There's so many, uh, not only Inuit, but Gwich'in women's hands that made these beautiful beadwork offers. And um, mm. yeah, I think it's something that is worthy of um, uh, heirloom for my granddaughter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that ended up being, um, I think a big part of the, that show was the way it was shown you know, the way it was hung, the way it was lit, um, it really made it more than it actually, I mean, it made it a spectacular show. Mm, yeah, that was Stefan <laughs> Saint Laurent. He was so good at that. He really listened well to what mm -hmm. you as artists wanted and what I as a curator wanted. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. very well presented. And um, Sissel's work too. I mean, they were all, we we're all so different, but very much alike as well. Like, you know, we use um, like the man-made industrial materials. And I keep thinking of Sissel. Of course, I love Sonia's work too, but mm -hmm. um, it was a great introduction to Sissel because I didn't know about her work. And um, I think of her work quite often. I'd really like to bring her here as well because um, uh, and Sonia, you know, have like a, a reunion here because uh, I started this artist residency and of course, uh, yeah, was very happy to receive the good news that that's it's going to continue on for this year. Oh, good. So, uh, yeah, we're thinking of Sissel mm -hmm. and trying to bring like international artists and um, yeah, and of course, you know, all our great Indigenous artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I should have started off by saying congratulations on being shortlisted for the Khinoya Qasibak Memorial oh Award. Oh, oh my God, because of you and Wanda, I was like, how could I say no to you women? <laughs> <laughs> Usually I'm like, oh, no, it's okay. But, yeah. you know, you have to honor those that, you know, think of your work and and. Um, yeah, Wanda was like, we have to, we have to nominate Maureen. We have to, I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, we have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, of course, it was a big yes, and um, and so thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, Kanu Yuak's work, and for me, uh, what I really admire is her ability to just, just speak her own language without speaking any English and being able to communicate, um, you know, in a very Inuit way, which I'm not capable of, you know, I don't carry the language. And it's a big part that's missing in my work um, is the understanding of many deeper levels, you know, when you know the language, you know, there's the myths and the legends and the stories and um, so much so I'm always trying to find a deeper meaning in my work you know when I'm working so you know in that sense when you carry your language I think it's so much more powerful and um, I really respect that that's funny that you say that you don't feel that you carry that level of meaning because actually right before this we got on this call I was thinking okay what's the most um What's the thing that really catches me in your work? And it really is that it is so Inuk. Like not yeah. just the subject matter, not just the way you do it, but also just the whole um, set of values that I can easily read in your work is just so Inuk. Like your use of materials that are uh, just around your community, the way that you presented Big Hello, for example, in a tent only accessible to those who were going out on the last <laughs> Um, the way that you talk about our connection to the land and your connection and your um, your love of the land and your worry about the land and about people. Um, like, I think that your work articulates it so well, this very Inuk sensibility, Inuvaluk sensibility about 
um, how life should be lived. So it's very funny to me that you say you don't have that level of meaning that Inoya had because I feel it's there and it's even like uh -huh. to me the most evident of of any work that I see happening today. That's incredible. Wow, thank you. That's that's huge because um I think it's because we live you know on the land and we're so so immersed in you know the waters and the land and we're very far from the city. So I think that really transcends into your work mm -hmm. you know it's it's part of your um practice to, you know to um i don't know relate the the land message you know the water message so i think that's probably where it comes from it's almost um like there's no language it's almost like a innate embedded kind of communication mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's it's it's like but it is the language that Inuit understand. I feel like Inuit I mm -hmm. mean it also communicates well to other people, but I feel like when we look at your work, we're just like oh that, yeah, oh like the um traveling what is it? can we show some of the works? <laughs> the one with the <laughs> the one with the hamutics lined up. I should have sent you some new stuff. I dined on you. So this one, it's like moving with joy across the land, right? As my face turns brown in the sun. Is that the whole title? Moving with joy across the ice. Oh, across as the ice. Face, yeah, as my yeah. face turn, turns brown from the sun. Yeah. I like, still have a little bit of that brown. Oh, that's so <laughs> From <funny>. the spring. <laughs> yeah. Like just the poetics of your title, and then the like, these are like, um, they're uh, monuments or testaments, mm, to... they are to individual families, but also community, yeah. you know, yeah. because we're all traveling in, in sleds and carrying our whole life with us, right, across the land and the ice during that springtime and all across the north. You know, so it, it speaks to all Inuit. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that you reference your ancestors, your father, your family members in your work and your connection to them. Like when you were little, like, is it, I mean, I'm sure you still do, but like, did you travel bundled up in Hamutik? Did you, like, are these your earliest memories, this being in Hamutik like that, or? Yeah, that was definitely part of our lifestyle, and um, probably more so back in the day. You know, now you have all kinds of skidoos and stuff and um, boggins, and, but those were the sleds that most of, almost every family had. You know, there was no such thing as boggins and those newer sleds. Um, yeah. yeah, so, yeah, they're a big part of... And you'd learn how to load them. Loading is absolutely important, right? Yeah. You have to you have to know where certain things go, your gas and your wood and your bedding and your tent and everything. Like, it just carries your whole... Uh, life with you right you're going out on the land to live on the land so you yeah. have to take everything that you need and try not to take too much <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> live very simply <laughs> so i wonder like when you were a kid did you did you feel that you were an artist or a maker or like did you, see you know what so so funny we used to um during the spring, we'd get spring break and uh, the school would take out students, right? And we'd all go and camp together with our best friends. And we had brand new um, eight by 10 tents. And of course, being a school with teachers, you have crayons and um, pencil crayons. So I was drawing on the tent. And of all things, I drew um, an elephant with an umbrella with the rain coming down 
<laughs> I'll never forget that. Um, yeah, so this was in probably middle school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was your that was the start of your artistic career <laughs> well drawing in a tent I yeah. guess on the tent not mm -hmm. on paper but on the canvas do you um but then when did you start doing exhibitions oh my goodness um well the first one was in 2012 with uh, Tanya Willard actually yeah. with custom made so yeah my career is very very late I didn't start until not too long ago yeah. um so that was my first show in Kamloops with um or 2015 sorry I graduated in 2012 and 2015 I just made made um I just produced for all those years and I had so many works that you know, I wasn't even thinking about a show or, or reaching out to any galleries. I was just making. And this is when we were living in Victoria. And uh, so I had a lot of inventory. And then Tanya um, in, invited me to do a show in Kamloops called Custom Made. And that's when I did the Moose Hide works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then your first show was with an Indigenous curator. Yes, and oh, you know so what? Nice. Yeah, she made it here for a visit um, when she was doing the land cur curating uh, landmarks. That was in 2017. Yeah, that's an interesting story in itself. Like I was, uh, we became, um, I guess, friends, and we'd send each other pictures, and I would send her pictures of you know what I'm doing when I come home for the summer. And, um, you know, sending pictures of polar bear skulls and um, beluga intestines and just things like that. And she was very intrigued. And she was, I think she was in um, Good Hope, not very far from here when she was doing landmarks. Mm -hmm. And she said, by any chance, are you beside um, uh, a park? Uh, and I said, that's my view, like right out my window here, that's a... Uh, Canadian landmark, the Pingo Park. Mm -hmm. And um, that happened to be the title of the whole show was Landmarks. And mm. this is the only landmark in Canada. So it was very fitting. Mm. Yeah, so she she jumped on the plane and came to visit. And I wasn't even part of that show. And uh, she was looking at my sketchbook. And I had a sketch of, um, you know, stitching the ice, mm -hmm. which I wanted to. I wanted to sew the ice. And she said, I'm going to pitch this to my co curators and and she did and they loved it and yeah so I wasn't even originally part of that show but mm. um it's been I think my career took off from from that show from being in landmarks in 2017 yeah and, um, yeah from there it's been pretty busy oh yeah you're all <laughs> over the place I was coming going last time I saw you it was only for a very short time yeah it was but uh but I don't travel much I'm I'm not a traveler I'm just so content to be here and to create yeah. and to experience all the seasons and mm -hmm. and you know not right now it's fishing season and mm -hmm. you know the the ice just left so mm. people are putting in their nets it's a good life yeah yeah <laughs> we just uh had a fish cookout at the indigenous day so I was collecting all the, the fish eggs in the pipe up the stomach and you know putting all that in with the belly of the fish and such good food yeah so good yeah what kind of fish white fish white fish yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway we'll move back to <laughs> yeah maybe talk about materials that you use because um oh my god so um just this spring when we we're out camping yeah we now have a cabin, which is really nice. But um, anyways, Kira, my assistant, she does the photography and we do some writing together and uh, she does the bookings for the shows. Anyway, she was out at Husky Lakes with me for, for 10 days. And there's the, these um, clay hills and there's actually erosion happening. So it's called Kikubioa. Um, clay hills mm -hmm. so I collected mm -hmm. part of that clay 
and I started um, making beads. And oh, I, nice. I, I put this proposal in too with the I in We Dark Foundation. So, you know, I received that grant. So now I can push forward and I've already started and I've got to show you. This is oh. um this is a bead from Kikogyuak, our local wow. clay. Yeah, and it's fired in my wood stove. And um, so I've got about a hundred four hundred of them mm-hmm. and the idea is to make as many. I always go in thousands. I just wish I would not work like that because it's so much work. Um, but I'd like to make at least a thousand of them to represent this community mm-hmm. of Kiltuyakto and how our our land is um, washing away like at a phenomenal rate. Um, mm-hmm. Erosion is happening very quickly. So you know, I'm trying to collect the land that's going into the ocean, like the clay. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that was my my proposal, the, the land that used to be, and, you know, bring it back to um, solidify it a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, just to hold on to it for a little bit longer. Mm. Yeah. That reminds me a little bit, there's these... Um ice mounds in Sami territory in Norway mm-hmm. that they're they are permafrost and they were there so long that they have actually tundra plants growing all on top of them and thin layer of sod but mm-hmm. because of climate change they're melting Slums. and sinking yeah. mm-hmm. so they're slumping and yeah. falling yeah. into the ocean yeah so that, that that's what I'll be doing all summer is going with the boat and collecting that clay mm-hmm. and trying to do some maybe some big installation pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you work with a lot of natural materials, even uh, animal parts, but also we were talking about that you go to the dump a lot because you don't like mm-hmm. to see things <laughs> wasted. Yeah, and it's such a great resource. Oh my yeah. God, I would not believe the things that we find there. Yeah. Uh, we have Ursula Johnson and and our and Angela Parsons here, and of course Rebecca and Scott Benesnab and Rebecca Belmore. And the dump was um, a place of great interest, and and there's so much material there to work with. Mm-hmm. Mm. So yeah, I've been harvesting from there, um, trying to do these uh, assemblages, yeah. I wonder how you feel about the mixing of uh, so-called natural materials and so-called man-made materials. Like, is there some sort of chemistry or anti-chemistry that happens when you mix them together? I think there's a beautiful chemistry. Um, They just, they're just so different, but um, they go so well together. I think um, I go by aesthetics, I guess, you know, what looks, what fits, what looks good together. Um, These assemblages that I'm doing, I think one of them is pink styrofoam, which is the frame for polar bear fur. And it's unreal how it just pops. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I love working with different materials like that. I think that's one way that you and Cecil's work kind of resonate too, because she has that yeah. aspect too, right? With the mm-hmm. very natural yeah. materials and then the yeah. rubber gloves or ballpoint <laughs> pens or whatever. <laughs> I love she would just love it here that's why um yeah you gotta get her up love to bring her here because we walk the beaches a lot we do a lot of um beach combing and so there's a lot of beluga whale vertebrae and um you know caribou antlers a lot of that at the dump you know when people are done with their their hunt so i go and saw off all the antlers and yeah yeah wow so there's lots of material. Wow, that's like, yeah, that's a trip. <laughs> it is. It totally is. Mm. It's, 
It's amazing. Speaking of Rebecca, she she was uh, at AGO recently talking about um, her work. And she said something that really kind of caught my attention about, and I'm sure she says this a lot, but it was the first time that I really kind of heard it and understood, like, all materials, everything on our planet is of the earth. Yes. You know, whatever we, whatever is man-made or whatever, it's not separate from the earth. It comes from the earth. And it's just, it got me thinking about, like, um, so then how do we uh, address the harm that humans have done in transforming those things that are of the earth into things for our own use? And I'm just uh, thinking about your use of objects from the dump and, um, you know, instead of like buying organic materials, you're reusing something that is otherwise just going to sit there and cause more of a pollution. Uh And this to me is like a very unique way to be environmentally friendly. You know, my dad used to say the same thing that Rebecca just said, that, you know, everything, our TVs, everything comes from the earth, you know, so you can't really separate the two. But I think the way that, um, you know, we use certain things like retardants and, you know, all those um, persistent organic pollutants, you know, that settle into the Arctic and and just talking with scientists that um, come into our community and and test the uh, the air even and and um, you know the microplastics and it's really hard to separate like it's part of our in our DNA now you know is the microplastics mm. um, you see a lot of it along the ocean so anytime we can use them and and turn it into beautiful creations it's it's a bonus Mm -hmm. i wonder like thinking about like working in her tent for example how do you see your work like in the history of inuit art how do you see your work progressing from her work to your work like how do you see the path or the connection? Mm, I think a lot of it is in silence, you know, and, and that beautiful quiet space of um, just sitting and creating and breathing and, and um, thinking, um, but mostly silence. And in that silence, I think, um, is where your materials speak to you or your your creativity flows. Um, yeah, and, you know, I was thinking that I just wish there was, you know, because Nunavut and the Northwest Territories are, they're alike, but they're, but in Nunavut, you carry the language. You know, here in the Western Arctic, we don't. Mm. Um, and it would have been nice to have her award in Nunavut, you know, and then uh, another award for those of us in the West. Mm. You know, because I love Ning's work too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's so many great artists and um, you just want to split it all up and, you know, yeah. give everybody an award. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, it would be would be something that I'd mm-hmm. like to possibly see. Mm-hmm. I remember the, what I was going to say earlier. I think I told you this in person before, but like a friend of mine and I, we were talking about your career and like how you just sort of like, it seems like <laughs> from the outside that you decided, okay, this is the time. 
And then you're just like, nothing's stopping you. And we're like, oh, be like Maureen. <laughs> nothing's going to stop you. <laughs> well, there's so many political things I'd like to do. And I'd really like eventually to do my, my dad's story, my mom and dad, but mostly my dad and his, you know, what, what he went through in his, his lifetime. That's a very interesting story. It's something, it's a story that needs to be told. And um, I just wanted to, I'm not ready to, um, I'm thinking about how to tell that story yet. But um, yeah, it's very, very powerful and important to, for Canadian history. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you, I think like some of your in, uh, I don't know, I feel like you put so much into your work, so much of yourself and so much of your values and also, but maybe difficult experiences too, or, or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, things you have to really be careful. Like I don't want to make it a, uh, uh, like, there's so much more, our values are so much more important than the, the greed and the corruption kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. but also that part has to be shown somehow, but um, I'm still trying to think through it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, could we show the, the one of the polar bear skins? What's that word called again? I die so coming home really, right or they have a yeah right home. we're finally home i think something like that i find this one very haunting mm, it was very interesting to do it was um the beginning of october when the ice first freezes up mm -hmm. and it was very thin ice and there was a full moon so that's why you see the different la uh, layers of ice you know the, the the tide would come up and then you know, the moon would pull the water and then it would go down and it created all these beautiful layers and these um, crystals around the, the bears mm -hmm. on the ice and everywhere in their mouth and on their skin. So they just felt like they were, they were home. Mm -hmm. They were in their element, uh, even though they were propped up by these, um, uh, what do you call those? Uh, serving rods or surveying posts iPods maybe iPods yeah yeah, yeah. and they came from the dump you know yeah. they came from a derelict building and yeah, um, yeah. so I, then where did you get these None the bears came from, from the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver mm -hmm. from Susan Rowley um she she contacted me and said she had these bears and would I be willing would I like to use them for my art and you can't refuse polar bear rugs right so I was so happy to to have them and and bring them home and I mean they're still here I'm not sure what the next step is I might just go leave them out on the ice mm. and just put them back to where where they belong mm. um yeah but it, it seems like you have like a great respect for all the materials that you use, and especially for the parts of animals. Mm, well, it's so, it's such a process. I mean, you know, it starts with the hunt and it's, and then it's for feeding the family, you know, it's, it's our subsistence and, and my parents didn't waste anything. You know, mm -hmm. we, we used everything, like everything is good to eat on an animal, including the hooves of a, uh, caribou and everything um there's a lot of traditions that we've lost you know like with um uh, stuffing the intestines and things like that mm -hmm. like we i think that or even using the whale the stomach of the, the whale for a bag to put your berries in and you know mm -hmm. preserving that i mean they always talk about how delicious it is and how good it was but I've never tried it you know mm. it's something that it's not really practiced anymore mm. so 
the materiality from the hunts and the, it's just such beautiful material, you know, right from the antlers to the hooves. I got to show you, this is um to show you these, these hooves. So I put a call out to uh, the hunters to bring me caribou hooves. And this was last year. So they brought me these hooves, many of them, and I had to cut them out and clean them. And then I sent them to Victoria and they did a 3D scan and they printed them. And um, I'd love to do a, a bigger art piece. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. Can you see that? yeah. And they, they would make beautiful shelters, like a yeah. big, huge uh, public art piece. Mm -hmm. And if you had like three of them, they just make these beautiful forms. Mm -hmm. This is actual caribou hooves, you yeah. know, yeah. For, for conversations about yeah. indigenous sovereignty and, and, and food and yeah. just everything, right? Our land. And yeah. so this is something we would like to, um, to work with as well or find you know something that's really someone out there yeah somebody hello Some maureen wants to do a public art piece any of you a people monumental one with the word <laughs> i need your help please little old me over here <laughs> but i think you were on i think you were maybe attending when i was talking to billy Gauthier a few weeks ago maybe I don't know. But anyway, we're talking about how, um, you know, the forms of our northern environments are reflected in the work artwork or in traditional designs or in, you know, and like, you can't help it. And it's like the most beautiful thing that you have to refer to is these forms that are in your environment. So that's a really beautiful thing, you know. There's... It is. And you know, our community is, it's Tuktu yep. you know, the caribou crossing or where the caribou cross. Yeah. And it's just so fitting. It would be nice if we could have it in our community mm -hmm. and, you know, not have to have it in a city somewhere, but yeah, I mean, that's just the way it is right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think, um, big public art piece like this would be funded I don't know I haven't thought it thought, thought it through but I got them made in this blue and uh, also black yeah. yeah but um ideally I would love to see it in steel yeah wow mm -hmm. yeah so that just, would be gorgeous almost really like good. petals of a flower <laughs> They are, they take on so many forms, yeah. you know, it's unbelievable what, yeah. uh, they're so simple, <gasps> they're so abstract and so meaningful, yeah. you know, I'm trying to like simplify, that. Yeah. I kind of like to work like that in a way too, I just make it as minimal mm -hmm. as I can. I can just hear their feet clicking when you're talking. Oh, you know that sound? <laughs> yes, I do know that. It's called yeah. click to dance. You know, when you hear them running on the rocks, yeah, and they just like such a beautiful sound, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beautiful rattles, too. Yeah, yes. huh. mm -hmm. can we show breathing hole? So, speaking of minimal, but this is minimal and maximal at the same time, minimal because you do one simple task will seem described as simple maybe it wasn't simple but but you did it many 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 times and again using leftover materials so the scraps of the scraps of the scraps mm -hmm. <laughs> little tiny pieces I just wanted to kind of see how far I could push using everything and not wasting yeah. and there's 18,000 sealskin punch outs mm -hmm. you know how you have um paper confetti yeah like that so yeah. um yeah so i just punched out not only myself i did this with um 
students in, at uh, SOVA in Dawson City. Mm -hmm. uh, we did an artist residency there and, you know, they did quite a bit of it. They helped me with punching out of the holes and, and pinning them onto this uh, dry core board. Mm -hmm. uh, blue styrofoam with um, just like cardboard, or not cardboard, or plywood backing. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so trying to push that as far as I could go with the seal skin. I, as I've said to you before, I really love multiples and I love um, mm -hmm. work that is created with sort of um, contemplative repetitive motions, because mm -hmm. I feel like, like all your thoughts are in there too. And the thoughts of the people who helped you, like, even if we can't see them or hear them, somehow they're communicated to us through that work. Mm -hmm. Your summer's so dense, you know, just packed really tight into that little square. Yeah. And um, I actually only have one here. I kept one, one mm -hmm. little square. But And then some of them have so much air to breathe, like that top, mm -hmm. the second one from the top, but the ones in the center are really condensed. So why, why did you call it breathing hole? Well, that's pretty obvious. Where the, I know, but we gotta like, you know, <laughs> gotta, we're on a webinar, we gotta spell it out. <laughs> you know, the come up and they, um, they have multiple breathing holes, right? I'm not a hunter, I'm not a seal hunter, but I can think I know this. And then just from reading our ancestors story as well, you know, um, one of the things uh, they talked about when seals come up, um, what was that saying? Uh, I have to think about it, but I got it on a panel, a vinyl panel that was one of um, the public art piece, temporary public art pieces that I did in downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, come up for air to blow the frost off. Mm -hmm. You know, come up for air and and blow the frost off, so you're clearing that seal hole. You know, to breathe. Uh, can we show Stitching My Landscape? So this is a public art piece or a temporary public art piece. Temporary, yes. Uh, I think this is the first um, work of yours that I saw an image of, like before I even knew your name. And I was like, just floored. Who's sewing up the ice? <laughs> 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 there's uh, 111 ice fishing holes mm -hmm. so yeah it went over a thousand feet wow. um, right off not far from just right out here on the ocean mm -hmm. um, but it was quite uh, quite a project yeah I was very fit at the time <laughs> um, 2017 but it was a very healing project because um, my father had passed away the year before. And so this was coming back home and um, closing up the ice road because it was the first year that our um, all weather access road was open. So we're connected now to the rest of the world through the, the ice or the highway. Mm -hmm. And um, that we were still a flying community then and we, the um, road was right up it came through here so that that was an old section of um the ice road that was no longer in use because um after a blizzard it kind of you know blows in so they have to plow another road and yeah I used that that's why you have the two line if you see the picture like the actual printout of um the zigzag you can see the ice road Mm. Mm -hmm. and why red I thought it was something that would really stand out and it's a color that we use in our traditional drum dancing parkas you know I mean we, we paint um, we used to use cranberries but we put uh, the red on the back of the fur the wolverine strips mm -hmm. I, I um Ever since seeing that one, I just always associate red with you. But there's some people mm. who I associate. Wanda's another one. So maybe that's where this like connection comes in. She's a red oh. person. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. yeah. 
And that can we just show the the composite photo? Just that's you doing the work, right? Mm -hmm. Like stills from video. Yeah, and um, the sound from that video is just the sounds from when we were doing the piece. Mm -hmm. So the wind and the, the chipping of the ice and the, the clearing away of the snow and me walking. Um, so we slowed the, the chisel. There was my dad's, one of his chisels. Oh, wow. That was, that was gifted to him by uh, his little grandson at the time. <laughs> he made it in school. And so I used that. And part of the sound was um, of the chisel hitting the ice, but we slowed it down to like a heartbeat. And <gasps> so that was part of that sound piece. Mm. Yeah. How do people in your community receive work that you do, like public work like this? I don't think anyone really seen it. Oh, really? No, I don't. I don't really. Um, um, I think contemporary art has to be introduced mm. in a big way. Mm. But yeah. so when you showed. Uh, big hello in the tent that like how was the reception of that from people who came to there see was, it? yeah yeah my niece um she came by with her with her friends and cousins and um she was just amazed she was like holding it she was just like these beads could talk <laughs> uh but it was yeah we've got a picture of her but hmm. yeah i think it's interesting. I don't really talk about my work here. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's so nice to have Kira to have that sounding board and discussions around mm -hmm. art. And, you know, the artist residency is just like a lifeblood, mm -hmm. a lifeline to the art world. You know, mm -hmm. it's just so wonderful to have these conversations. So how long have you been uh, hosting the artist residency? Just the first year, I've only had um, uh, the four last year, mm -hmm. last summer, that last fall, and then um, I didn't get it the second time I applied, but we just received the funding this year, so, yeah. so I'm still thinking about who I'd love to bring mm -hmm. um, and, um, and try to get the community involved this time. Yeah, I did. You know, I took them around to different artists and but in the late fall, the like the students are out of school and it's not very enjoyable in the winter because, you know, you can't really spend time outdoors. They're yeah. very long. So I tried to bring them in the fall time during berry picking season mm -hmm. or uh, the other time would be in the spring when we go camping. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds amazing. <laughs> oh, it is. It was really wonderful. Really a great time. Mm. Yeah. Do you have um, exhibitions coming up? But like, if I mean, people can go on your website, and there are many amazing exhibitions you've been in solo and group. Um, and just wondering about what you have upcoming that people can look forward to seeing. Um. Well, the one in Norway, and I'm not even keeping track. I'm sorry, that's a Kira question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, Kira? Don't go, no. <laughs> I don't go to most of the openings or, you know, I'm just, uh, but it was so wonderful when I do actually go out. I enjoy it so much, mm. you know, when I'm in the midst of all you people, mm. it's just great. And, and my husband always tells me, um, when you get there, you'll be so grateful that you actually did come. And it's so true. Yeah. And everybody's <laughs> grateful when you show up. It was just such but a wonderful time, time when we had you in Ottawa. Like, oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> I just want to go home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Is there a work of yours that you, that is like your favorite or your, you're just so, so special to you? Hmm. Um. Jeez, I don't know. 
I think um, the one at the National Gallery, uh, that one I think was really, when I was making it, I kind of knew that it was a message that, you know, wasn't going to be in my possession or it wasn't going to be in a private private collection. Um, What's that one called again? Message. Message. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 17 feet long and it's mm-hmm. uh, a woven polar bear piece with the guard hair yeah. and it's a Morse code pattern, mm-hmm. SOS. Yeah, so that mm-hmm. one I think was was more uh, given to me to put out there. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there... Okay, you want to do public art in your community. Is there another? Like, or anywhere. I think anywhere. it's like, like <laughs> okay, yeah, the hooves, the hooves, I think, are, they could be all across Canada. Yeah. <laughs> you know, make a trail. You can make a trail. A tuk-tuk yeah, trail. A trail. Mm-hmm. Or the four-legged trail or, you know, it's just, it honestly is, um, a beautiful form. Mm. Yeah. Is there any kind of um, other other than that? Is there another? Are there any big projects that you would love to realize or collaborations that you would love to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is. There's a lot of people I'd love to to bring here and work with, and um, there's so much to do. We have a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I'm so excited about working with clay. You know, mm-hmm. it's been such a long time, and it's such a beautiful material. It's just raw. It's just coming right off the the tundra, and um, you know, it's not cleaned or treated. So every bead is a little bit different. It fires differently. You know, mm-hmm. some are black. Some are terracotta um, some are gray uh, it's just such a beautiful material mm-hmm. and um, yeah oh, and so guess. healing I'm also collecting stories about um, uh, traditional uses of clay mm. here in the community because we we don't use that material anymore um, and it hasn't been used for a long time um, I think you only find them like shards and artifacts, you know, along old uh, sites. So I'm really excited about bringing it back and maybe bringing it into the school to have the kids work with the clay mm-hmm. and, and teach them or tell them about the stories that I've collected so far. And it's a very healing material. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I keep saying that. Does it's it very- smell? Does it have a smell? No, there's no. no real no, no, no. What color is it when you're like before you it's process? Very, very dark gray. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. When you were growing up, were there artists around you? All the time. Yeah, yeah. there was carvers outside, probably like your community, right? Mm-hmm. All these carvers working outside. And um and my mom was always sewing too. So we, we were always part of, um, we had to learn how to sew. I mean, there were seven of us girls mm-hmm. and um, we all had to learn how to sew. Mm-hmm. That was uh, part of the traditional teachings, right? Yeah. You had to learn to sew and how to cook. <laughs> I mean, that's one thing that I find very exciting about your work is that you bring all of your knowledge to bear. Like you've got uh, your contemporary art, conceptual, and then experimentation, and also your very traditional Inuit skills. But I love to hunt too. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to go hunting with my dad, and yeah, and um, I had this awesome double barrel twenty gauge shotgun, and mm-hmm. I just love that. I mean, the hunting part is so exciting too. Mm-hmm. I love you know working outside and kind of the guy's work you know? yeah to Both. be able to provide for yourself and your family yes yeah. 
So I think we're almost at question time, but I wonder if there's anything else that I didn't ask that you're like, oh, she should have asked that. <laughs> <laughs> the next time we visit. For next time we visit? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then I guess we'll open up to questions from participants. And uh, yeah, just thank you for being here with me Maureen and I'm just mm. so thrilled to talk to you and I miss you <laughs> I'm just telling my friend um before she um she cooked dinner today she's doing caribou ribs and um, I was telling her about when I had uh, reindeer with you and and broth like just reindeer broth instead of coffee or tea we had reindeer broth and it was so good and your husband was like this is the traditional coffee this is a traditional tea, yeah, you know? Sami style of uh, caribou reindeer meal. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, it was so good. <laughs> hmm. I'll send him up. He can cook for you. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Come and hunt. No, oh, he would love it. Yeah. He would be in heaven. Uh, so then I have a question. All right. So this has sort of come up for me a couple of times recently uh, in various conversations, but just about impermanence in your artwork, in artwork in general, like Indigenous artwork. But for you have some pieces that have been acquired and and are, you know, permanent, but much of your work is land-based art that that can't necessarily like stay there forever or even exist anywhere. Like you're stitching my landscape, for example, like was that, that impermanence an intentional choice or is it just what goes along with having public art like that? I'm really glad you asked that question because um Stitching my landscape material was all retrieved and um, I had two youth go with a canoe and retrieve all that material and put it in my basement until I got back. And now it's become a new piece, which I just did um, in the springtime. Or was it, was it last? No, the spring with a uh, tuck TV, a youth group. And we filmed it. I created a, a red cross with it. And mm -hmm. it's, I think it was like 56 feet by, uh, I forget the measurements, um, but it's huge, 26 feet by 58 feet. And it was filmed with a drone as well. So we have the youth around, we were all standing around it and waving. So it's um, a new short film that I did with, with the work and um, with all that red material. So now I have two panels and I think there should, it'll probably become something else again, you know, going from stitching my landscape to a red cross, um, drawing attention to, you know, the uh, er Arctic erosion and climate change and, all these things that are happening happening in the Arctic. So, yeah. Wow. That was like the best question ever. <laughs> best answer. <laughs> yeah, so awesome. Do you have a favorite medium that you've worked with? Mm, no. No, I like to change. It's really hard for me to do things twice you know I do a one of and then I got to move on to something else yeah so I can't uh, it's hard for me to stay with one medium the fox fur stretching you might do mm. that appears in your work in multiples my dad's fox stretcher yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it represents him the most because mm. he was a prolific trapper. That's how he, um, I think that's how he took care of so many people was through his trapping. 
Mm. And he was able to become uh, an entrepreneur through his trapping. So he was a very hard worker, um, but provided for the community. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think it's really beautiful that you pay tribute to him many times over. Yes, there mm. will be more. Mm. I think there's a question. Yeah, there's a question from Tess mm -hmm. McCoy. Mm -hmm. You spoke about gathering stories several times. Do you feel that gathering stories from the community is a part of your process of creation? I think so. Um, the piece that's at WAG right now, um, it's called Dick Dalek. And it's about this mother and her children. And she was one of the last nomads. And she had the traditional tattoos on her her face and she lived in um, <clears throat> Banks Island or Saks Harbor. And um, yeah, she, she was the last one to, to travel with her dogs and, you know, hunt polar bears and take care of her children on her own. Um, so her stories are really interesting. And I paid tribute to her by that piece that's in um, the WAG right now. And um, it's with her daughter's uh, woven muskox mitts that, you know, she was well known for her. one of her daughters, Lena Wolke. Uh, she knitted these beautiful uh, uming muck or muskox mitts and scarves and sweaters. And um, she no longer does that. And then I got these um, muskox needles that were carved by a local carver. And... Um, yeah, so I just put that all together and her stories, which were so amazing. Um, and if you want to read them, you have to go to the WAG. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Katie Lawson says, thank you so much for this conversation. You mentioned the start of fishing season. Is there another aspect of the coming season that you are most looking forward to in your community? I'm wondering if you can speak to the influence of the cycles of season on your art making process. Wow, this is a very good question. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, seasons is a huge part because right now we've just put our boat in the water a few days ago and um, we've already walked the beach and collected some whale bones and um, whale teeth and and just whatever you find on the beach that's interesting to you. But um, yeah, and then in terms of what I'm looking forward to, it's almost uh, up big season time. So <laughs> yes. yeah, like mid, mid August, it may be earlier because we did have an early spring. So yeah, the flowers have already bloomed and um, yeah, it shouldn't be too long before we have our cloud berries. Mm. I sent you a picture. I finished all those red berries that you sent me. Delicious to the uh, last bite. <laughs> what I've been doing ever since I, um, I got COVID a couple of years ago, I started drinking cranberry tea that I, mm -hmm. you, know, you just make your regular cranberry sauce, but it has to be tundra cranberries. Yeah. You know, ones that I sent you and yeah. uh, and you put a tablespoon or teaspoon of that in a cup of hot water with some honey and oh my god is it, that's all I drink now yeah yeah yeah, just, huh? yeah so, I mean I think people from good drug doing that too whenever they get a cold or whatever just mm -hmm. they're asking yeah. around if anybody has red berries yeah and honestly you get all your vitamins from it you I used to have to have fruit every day but now that I drink the tea, I think I get all my vitamins from the cranberries. Mm. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. Um. Oh, Kyle, Kyle, and can I come hunting with you? <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and you have lots of family in Inuvik too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's the best question. That one was the best. Yeah. 
<laughs> Not that there's a competition, but that was a very good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Tiger. Like it's been mm -hmm. such a nice, nice visit. Nice to see you. Yeah, I'm so and proud I, of you. I, yeah. And you too. Mm -hmm. It goes both ways. I think mm -hmm. uh, you're enjoying your new position. Yeah, yeah. I get to I get to work with any artists. Like you know, I love that. <laughs> In a big way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's so great. Mm -hmm. Well, nice chatting with you. Are mm -hmm. we? Are we Thank you for being so generous with your conversation and your knowledge and your time. Uh, it's this is um, a very special occasion, you know, and I just want to just to talk about all the artists, the short list, the long list, and all Inuit, all artists across the north. You know, we're all doing important work, and um, you know, eventually we, we we can just show anywhere nowadays right with your phone you know put your pieces out on the ice even on candle ice that's another beautiful plinth that i just found out i put the hooves on the candle ice and they make beautiful plinths um and take pictures beautiful photography <laughs> yeah lots to do even young people you know yeah. nowadays you can share things you know it doesn't have to be a gallery it can be anywhere that's the anywhere. nice about the sort of changing world and technology is that sort of access for so many people to be able to share yes. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well thank you so much both Tukulik and Maureen for having this fantastic conversation today um and good luck for September oh, very nice. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, this is the the fourth of five artist talks taking place every Thursday. Thank you both, Nakumik, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their day. Mm -hmm. Take good care. <laughs>